Welcome back to the Ride and Laugh podcast. If you love mountain biking, you are in the right place. Picture your last group ride. You had a ton of fun. You're back at the parking lot. The stoke is high. Everyone's talking bikes, nutrition, tech, gear. That's what we do here every week. We love bikes. You love bikes. Let's drop in. Sage, how are you today, my friend? Man, I am doing awesome. I mean, we just, ah, oh, man, what a great week. We, we launched officially to the public and yeah. the reception has been awesome. I, I think we had something like, uh, 150 views on YouTube, like 60 subscribers, uh, 170 downloads across all podcasting platforms. Uh, And we even had like uh, listeners from uh, across the globe. Uh, I think the farthest one that I I could see was uh, Australia. So thank you, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, so good. It's so good to know that this was welcomed and well received. Dan, I know you got some comments from some of our listeners too, right? Yeah, we got comments. We appreciate everybody uh, listening and giving us a, 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 a nice review and giving and subscribing on the YouTube. It's awesome. And and we've been asking for comments. We want a community. We want people to to interact. We want to know what's going on. And you guys are going to give us uh, some some new topics and some things to talk about and some feedback. And we got some really really cool comments. Um, just just to just to peruse here, we have Nick Lusky, and he said that Mount Penn skyline jumps that we talked about recently uh, are kind of a bucket list item for him. He understands Sage's hesitancy on the steep lips. Uh, But then he was talking about not needing to follow someone in. He went to Bentonville and he did drop the hammer without a lead in by himself, no toe. And uh, so that that's a really big drop. So nice job there, uh, Nick. And um, that's on my bucket list. Definitely. Bentonville sounds awesome. I'm sure a lot of our listeners have been there. Ben Heck Spokes yeah. mountain bike, uh, which Steve. is our, our buddy Steve, and he has he had some awesome feedback. He's um, big on at the jumps at Sears, and uh, he helps Sage and Stick uh, ride through those. And so he was talking about jumping, and one of the things that he says to himself is his his words of encouragement is "You're a good jumper. You you got this." And one of the things I really like that I think I'm going to take is that he he tells himself, "I have good instincts in the air." Yes. which is, I thought was really cool. You know, you get, yeah. you get scared when you're in the air, right? You don't want to become that dead sailor. And so instead you just start, you know, hey, I got good, good instincts in the air. You're that I am power. I am good at jumping mountain bikes, making it happen. All right. And then uh, Logan, who is one of our local riders, uh, Burke's Yo. Trail Works, all around awesome yes. dude. And, and he was telling us about his visualization and that he, he prefers to watch someone do it instead of getting towed in. And uh, he had a lot of really great feedback. One of the interesting things that I, I thought that he said that we hadn't talked about was when in the ride he wants to try a new feature. Yeah. And so he said he likes to do it early in the ride when he's fresh, before he's, before he's tired, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, what, what do you think, Sage? When, when do you like to hit a new feature? Yo, I, I don't know that I'd actually put like a, a time constraint on it, but I, I definitely... I, Hans Ray, actually, Logan was there, and he was one of the... Yeah one of the guys that actually helped us get through that, that feature. But like that happened for me, not because of when it happened in the ride, but because you and I had like stacked so many wins together before getting to that feature. Uh, it just oh. so happened to be toward the end of the ride. But um, yeah, I, I think it's less about the amount of time and just the confidence level up into that point. So if we're riding really well, I- I'm ready to go. You got to get there before you're tired, right? So yeah, if you yeah, wait too long. Yeah. And you're tired and you're having a hard time focusing or your body's just not responding the way you need it to, then, you know, then abort. Uh, yes. But yeah, I think I'm probably middle towards the end of a ride, middle of the ride. Certainly I need to warm up. I need to, I need to get some wins and get some confidence. But I know we've done things early in a ride and uh, we've done some pretty high consequence things. And then just adrenally, you're like, okay, I just, I just want to pedal around now. I'm, I'm done. Yes. I'm ready to go get breakfast. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm just mentally already exhausted. So, yeah. you know, maybe you want to save that, <laughs> that burnout until the end of the ride, but um, you know, what, whatever works. And if, if you're good enough to do it early in the ride when you're fresh and you don't need to warm up, 
like Sage and apparently like Logan, uh, then then yeah, go for it. But that, I thought that was an interesting that was an interesting thing. I, I definitely like to to get my momentum going um, and stacking those wins. And then we had a really nice message from Mark, who just said that the the pod's awesome and he looks forward to to each episode, and uh, that's really cool. So flattery might get you mentioned on the podcast as well. So thank thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Shout out, Mark. And and speaking of flattery. Dan, you you were on a little bit of a press tour this week. Yes, yes, the ride and laugh junket. <laughs> yeah. is, it, is that the wrong word? That might be the wrong word. I have no idea. But uh, yeah, I got invited to be on a live webcast with uh, Johnny Yu, which and and his show is called uh, and Mountain Bike Q and A, yes. and he's got. Trail Sage has been on as a as a kind of a big deal in this area. You know what I mean? Uh, kind of Trail, a big so deal. Trail Sage has been on. He knew Johnny. And he had sent Johnny some of uh, the podcast before we even went live. And and Johnny said, "I gotta I gotta interview Dan." And Johnny's interviewed all sorts of really kind of high profile people in in our little mountain bike world. So I was very very flattered. And uh, super nice guy. I had a I had a ton of fun. We did it last night. So we're recording this on a Thursday. We did it. Uh, on Wednesday, if you want to see it, just just go into YouTube. I think it will also be on your podcast players at um, Mountain Bike Q and A, or maybe MTV Q and A. We should check that. And then, uh, but you can also see it on YouTube, and you can see everyone's comments because it was a live feed. So that's kind of fun, also. So if you go to Mountain Bike Q and A and you and you click on podcast, it'll come there. It, will, it may not be in the video profile. That's what I saw today, but it was a lot of fun. Great guy, yeah. really good interviewer. Uh, comments were hilarious. We talked for, for about 90 minutes and, uh, you know, dude loves mountain biking. So, you know, he's, he's my kind of people. I thought it was great. You, you watched this age. What did you think? Man, I, I was, first of all, Johnny's the best. Like I totally agree. I mean, he's just so yeah. easy to talk to uh, really funny guy, just really naturally funny guy. But I thought the interview went really well. And it's not just about uh, the Ride and Laugh podcast. He got into your history, your background. Uh, and and I, I, listen, I know you pretty well. And I still found it like extremely fascinating. So if you are interested in getting to know Dan or Danny, uh, it, it's a great way to, to kind of really get an in-depth view to what, kind of what makes you tick. So I, I really enjoyed that. I bet it was refreshing for you to see me telling someone else to get a gratitude journal. That must have been yeah. a nice moment for you. When you're like, oh, good. Like, he's not yelling at me about writing gratitude now. Now, now he's giving Johnny a... But, but at the end of the show, Johnny picks up a journal. He's sold. He's ready. He's in. <laughs> ride and read. Ride and read. The ride and read. <laughs> That's right. Ride and read. Throwback from another, another episode. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we didn't get a lot of rides in together recently because the weather has been very very poor and um and then i was in arizona for a week with my wife and if you listen to the interview with johnny you would know that i have a uh, we bought a, a little investment property out there about five six years ago on my wife's recommendation we have family out there she said we should buy a place out here it's a good investment and i was really nervous and until she said you know, you could buy a mountain bike and keep it out here. And I was like, oh, yeah. well, then, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a really good idea that we buy a house and it just happens to come with a Yeti, you know? So that's, that's yeah. great, you know? <laughs> I put that on a Strava feed one time that my, my house in Arizona came with the Yeti and I remember Stick being like, really? Do they do that out there? Yeah, like, <laughs> no, Stick, that's not, that's not real. <laughs> but I think that'd be a really awesome selling point, you know? Yeah, maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe we're onto something. We, we know a couple of realtors we can... You know, sweet, sweet. Yo, the pot shout here. out Brian. Yeah, yeah. Brian, yeah. easy trader. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And Betts, our buddy Betts is a realtor too. That's right. Uh, different states, not competing. Yeah. So we go to Arizona quite often, and I do have a mountain bike there, and I ride. There's awesome trails in the Phoenix area. A lot of tech. A lot of things that I really like. So I went and I rode South Mountain. I ride them. Uh, I have a national trail loop that I do there, which is awesome. And then I rode uh, Gold Canyon, which has a couple, like a double black, really tough line, which I did 90% of. Uh, and then I also rode Halls, Boulder Dash, which is a, a newer double black tech line. And yeah. um, they, they, those rides all kind of build on each other. And I was getting more and more confident as, as I went. I was stacking wins each ride. 
and feeling better and better. And, and was, I was using all the mantras we've been talking about as far as feeling, trusting, trusting my skills and being able to access my skills by becoming grounded. And just the word I was using was trust or commit. You got this. And um, staying low and weight over my bottom brackets. And uh, so I felt like there was a little bit of nice progression there. I felt I was feeling really good by the end of the trip. And it was it was a lot of fun. The riding out there is very, very different. It's a beautiful time of year out there. Uh, it's very, very different. It's very, very chunky. Um, and, uh, and, and and I love it. It's really fun. And, you know, the weather's fantastic. So you, when you're out there, Danny, you're you're mostly solo. I mean, are you having mm-hmm. to approach your rides a little bit different because you're solo? Because usually it's, it's you and I, I feel like a sense of safety. You know, it's like yes. an encouragement. Like how many times do we like turn turn to each other? Like, yo, I got this right. Like you yes. got no one else to like tell you, yo, you got this. It's all on you. There's a, there's a lot of moments where I'm where I'm like next time Sage visits, I'm I'm yeah, doing this. Yeah. There, there's yeah. been a, there's been a lot of those moments, and one of those moments was riding down the waterfall on National Trail. Yeah. And I had never done it before. I had looked at it a hundred times. There's other downhill lines on that trail. I ride that trail all the way out to anyone that knows that to Telegraph, and then and then take the road back up, and and then loop around and ride national all the way back to the lot. And there's other downhills in that line, in that route that I think are probably harder. But this, yeah. the waterfall is, is iconic. First of all, climbing up it is, is epically hard. And, and, you know, it's kind of, it's almost a trials move Though we did recently see someone actually pedal up it, which was really encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, on Instagram. And, uh, and then when I got up to it, it was like, eh, it's starting to feel like maybe this is possible, but my God, it is, it is, it is so hard. It is so much power. It is so many tight moves. Um, if having like the trials moves would really help to be able to hop around. Uh, yeah. so anyways, but going down it is, is also a kind of, it's also scary. It's, it's steep yeah. and you do, if you fall off of it, you're going to get hurt. Um, there's a very distinct line and it's not really smooth. The ending looks a little bit janky and, and I, and that always kind of threw me off. Um, and it's definitely one of those things where you kind of don't see the line until you roll right up onto it. Yeah. And yeah. so I had ridden that set many, many times before we did our Arizona trip. So, and, and I had always walked down it. I looked at it. I thought I could do it, but I just always walked down it and I'm by myself. So I'm not taking any chances of you know getting a catastrophic injury or at least not on purpose <laughs> um out in arizona by myself and so then so then when you came out to visit and we did a, a, a week-long trip out there and you know sage took one look at it we, we walked to the top first sage wanted to climb it and then you tried really hard to climb it didn't get yeah, I did. anywhere at all nope. and you were nope. so frustrated and i was like dude the ride just started like we cannot it's hot yeah. We cannot spend an hour and a half here. Like, if you want to come and just try the waterfall, we can do that. But that's not that's not today. Uh, But so we tried for a long time to climb it, and then we get to the top, and you just went over and looked at it at the downhill because you're not going to hit it uh, until it's a different line going down. You're not going to hit it until we're on our way back, and you just looked at it and you were like, okay. And then we kept riding, and then I'm behind you at that point in the ride when we get when we return to it, which is probably like an hour and a half later. And you just went for it and flowed down it. And I just followed you and flowed down it. And I had never done it before. And uh, it was it was awesome. And it was it was no big deal. And then the next trip I went out by myself, I didn't do it again. (laughs) (laughs) But I have started doing it again. And that, that may be because of a new bike, which I will be talking about later and how maybe a new bike can add confidence and and level us up so that's something that we will be getting into later uh this pod for a little bit maybe as a as a standalone subject because it's something i'm really interested in so um but yeah arizona was really fun and uh and there's definitely there's definitely things that i have on our checklist for the next time that you visit that i'm not doing by myself or if someone in arizona wants to ride with me and 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 show me some of these lines there's a couple in Gold Canyon, a couple double black lines um, up on. Uh, well, I don't need to get into the details. If you ride Gold Canyon, you know, you know where they are. Um, but yeah, and there's a couple other lines on National that you know alternate lines that are a little bit. Uh, there's a bunch of them actually that are that I have not done yet that look pretty gnarly. So 
there's yeah. uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot of progression that can happen there, and that's just that's like their main riding area. That's like the city park. So it's it's pretty cool if you like. Yeah, Black Diamond Tech. Yeah, I remember those rides very distinctly. I just like it's such a, you know, coming from the East Coast and being so used to the terrain that we have here. That was that was absolutely eye-opening to to come into something like that first of all there's no dirt like it's it's just all yeah. what they call kitty litter and i'm making air quotes there but kitty litter is basically like this marbly like sand and my goodness it, it as you know as it, we talked about in one of the podcasts earlier I, like when i get to a trailhead the first thing i do is i'm testing the trail i'm testing the traction um the grip and turns all this stuff the grip on the rocks i, I must have spent at least 10 or 20 minutes just trying to understand how my bike would react because mm. for lack of a better word i am somewhat underbiked. i guess i guess by today's t- standards my it turns out mojo, that we have been underbiked. yes i didn't yes, realize yeah. it until until i've either there now i'm either overbiked or adequately biked for what we do mm. <laughs> but yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think i think um i think a regular down country bike is is underbiked by today's yeah. standards and, and by what we do. So yeah, please continue. Yeah, so I, I think that was, but strangely enough, I actually felt really comfortable uh, on most of the features. And we did some big stuff. I mean, you had mentioned the waterfall, but on our trip, uh, and this is going back at least two years ago, we had done uh, La Mila Grossa, uh, and then that that whole uh, Green Tucson. Mountain, that lemon drop. Yeah, that was, that might've been the most technical ride I've ever done. And, and that was long. That was like a five, six hour day. And the tech there was the just whole unreal. ride in total. You would say that whole, if you took that whole ride in total, you would say that was, that was the most technical ride. Really? I think so, man. Just did. First of all, we started in the snow. I mean, the green mountain yeah. was like literally a glacier and yeah. that had its challenges in itself, but we went through like probably like four different ecosystems on that ride. Yes. That's and what I was going to say before, yeah. Yeah, and each one of those places, right? You had uh, Green Mountain, Bug Spring, um, the, that, uh, what was it? The, AZ. some kind of camp? Yes, yeah. AZ oh, yeah. something. Prison camp? Prison camp, Prison yeah. camp, yes, yes. And then, and then La, La Milagrosa at the end, which was like desert trail. And That's double black, yeah. Yeah, it was, and, it, and that had a waterfall in it too. That, that thing was uh-huh. sick. Yes. Yeah. But, that whole time, I never actually felt like, even though I was probably underbiked, I never felt like I was underbiked. I mean, that, that mojo is it's pretty old in, in today's standards. The Geo is just coming out, uh, but I, I really enjoyed that bike there. I, I, I'll be, I know I'm going to need a new bike soon, but you know, I'll, I'll be sad you to love see that, that thing mojo. Go. So let's get into it. We're going we're gonna to learn a little bit more about your, uh, about your podcast host today. We're going to be talking about the bikes that we have in our, in our stable, which is just an old timey word for garage. Uh, but you know, we're, we're guys that have, that are in our, our late forties. We've amassed some bikes and, and, and each one has its own uh, special purpose. And, and which of these do we recommend? Which of these could add to progression and skill and how would it do that? And then if we could, get a new bike in a different category. Like obviously you, you know, you, you would be interested in a, a new full suspension bike, but if you get a new bike in any category, what, what would that be? But let's, let's start with, because you already got into it. Let's start with your current full suspension bike, which is a, what, you go ahead and, and take it over at this point here, man. Yeah. It's a, a 2018 Ibis Mojo. Uh, and it is a 27.5, which is the wheel diameter. So most, most bikes, most current bikes now, I think, are in that 29-inch category, but I, I just love my 27.5 wheels, and uh, the only upgrade that I've done to that bike is... What do you I've like about 27.5? Why don't... Why don't oh. just, just to interrupt, why, why not a 29er? It's much easier to get a 29er. Yeah, it 29er really is. 29er is the default wheel size now. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Because when we first started out, it was like 26. <laughs> Yeah, so it was crazy. 26. And when 29ers came out, like everyone was in an uproar, like they were e-bikes, like 
This yeah. is horrible. These things. I'm not, they used to call them like clown bikes, right? You know, like I'll never yes. ride those clown those clown wheels. You know, look so crazy. And now, now anything now twenty seven five wheels look small. You know, like a lot of yeah. a twenty six inch wheel on a on a full size mountain bike looks really tiny. So yeah, twenty yeah, ers add a tremendous amount of rollover. It really helps keep momentum yeah. and rollover. And twenty seven five. While, while maybe just naturally better for shorter people, though I know a lot of people shorter than you that ride 29er. Yeah, stick. Um, you know, it's supposed to be more more playful. So w- what has your experience been on 29ers? Well, my experience on 29ers has not been good, but, you know, that's also older geo. So yeah. I, I am willing to kind of give it another shot. But I have to be honest, I, I just really love the playfulness and flickability yeah. Of the twenty seven five and the and the flickability, you know, you could argue that's less about the the wheel and and more about the frame. You know, having shorter chain stays and things of that nature uh, make a bike more playful and flickable as well. I just, I if you ever watch me ride, and there's not much footage of, of me me riding, uh, but I I tend to move a lot on my bike, like unnecessarily moving my body around. Because that's just it the works. way I like to ride. Yeah, it works for me. Yeah. It works for me really well. Um, but yeah, I'm constantly shifting my body around and moving around. I'm, I'm hucking off of things. And I, I, to me, that wheel size and that bike lends itself really well to that kind of riding. You know, am I able to keep up with you on those long downhills with, you know, a lot of chunk? No, that's that's probably where I get hung up the most. You know, something like a stage three at Mount Penn, which is just a uh, a very straight downhill run, uh, but it's full of these like baby's head rocks the whole way down. And my wheels do get caught up in that. It is hard to float over that. And obviously speed kills and the faster that you're able to go kind of nullifies some of that. But it also, it also gets it to be a lot more scarier too, because where your tires might be floating over things or kind of like rolling over things, I'm getting stuck in those little divots. If I'm not, if I'm not all my game and I'm not paying attention, looking really far ahead, you know, those little divots, they add up and then you end up going like, you know, you lose a little bit here. You lose a little bit here, lose a little bit. I look up and you're like, you know, five minutes ahead on the trail, you know? So it's, yeah. you do feel well, it. The street you do trails. feel it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So the wheel size, I would, I would love to see you be able to demo both like a, a modern, 27.5 and also a 29er. Hopefully we can, we'll see some demo opportunities this summer. That's what I'm really hoping that you can Yo. get a chance. And if you come out to Arizona, which we hopefully we could do it at the end of the summer, uh, you can definitely demo uh, a pivot, you know, right from the factory over to South mountain. So that would be, that'd be pretty dope uh, as well. Yeah. The, the, the bike itself is older geometry and, you were saying that the travel, you replaced the fork. So just, just real quick, what, what's the travel on that? It, it came as a 130, 140. Uh, so 130 in the back, 140 in the front. And I had them upgrade the front shock to a 150, and that made a huge difference. I mean, I, I'm one of those people that, that I might not know the numbers. You know, I, I don't get into the numbers and like, oh, you know, this angle is at this and this chain stays this long. But I do feel the nuances of little changes and, you know, 150, that might only be 10 millimeters. That's not even an, an inch, really. I, I definitely can feel the difference. And it's just that that much more protection, you know, in case you, you yeah. screw up. And uh, it's been nice. Yeah. What, what I love about that bike is the DW link. And that's going to be really hard to give up because that thing climbs like a mountain goat. And uh, I do like to climb as much as I love blowing down a downhill. I do love to climb. Um, as I understand it, you were telling me that the DW link is actually that the patent is up. So who right. knows? Maybe some other yeah. bike companies might just start to use that technology. Yeah. Right now, you only really see it on uh, pivots and IBIS uh, officially. And yeah. I think it was on Turner's back in the day. So, uh, but yeah, with that, with the, um, the, Patent being up, then we might start to see some some really cool designs uh, come come to be. And and I will say, you know, I've ridden VW Link, and and it is eye opening. It is eye opening. The the support and the climbing uh, prowess has w- w- really kind of blew me away. Uh, I'll get more into that uh, in a little bit. But um, 
But the, the, I will say there's a lot of other bikes that are that are really well done. You know, maybe you're yeah. losing one one or five percent on, on the climb, but the suspension is, is really well done and and really comfortable. And I think the whether or not it's DW Link or not, I think if you were to upgrade to a, a newer bike that's going to be slacker and have more travel, I think that I think that was a really good chance that would unlock another level in you. I hate to think about you getting faster because you're already so fast, but it would it would make you faster. And it might make you more comfortable on jumps if you're, if, you know, I know dirt jumpers are pretty steep, but in my experience, the slacker the bike, the, the more confidence at speed and then the more confidence yeah. in the air uh, for my small experience of riding something that's pretty slack. And, um, you know, maybe you would lose a little bit in the real slow speed tech, but I don't think you would because you'd still be on a pretty small bike because you're not a big guy. So I think our, our, our real tight technical stuff in the Northeast and, and probably in the Pacific Northwest and places like that, I think that you would still be able to have a pretty snappy bike. So I, I'm real excited for you. I'm, I'm manifesting a new bike for you. I write it in my journal that Sage gets a new bike. So. Yeah. Well, that yeah. would be awesome. Tell, tell us about your full suspension bike. I, I rode for years. I was riding anyone that watched trail stage videos. I was riding a, like a blue 2019 stump jumper. And that was a, 150 140 travel with um and it was it was you know firmly in the down country kind of range i didn't realize it at the time but and that bike really leveled me up i love that bike um i have i have a lot of miles on it and there was anyone that's been on you know into a bike shop knows that they're overstocked and there were some really good deals on some awesome bikes and my local shop, Keswick Cycles, has just always been awesome to me, and um, they really hooked me up, and I got a new specialized Evo, and um, I was able to get the S-Works version, so it's like, it's the Cadillac. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's lightweight. It's in between an Enduro bike and a trail bike. It's got adjustable geometry. You can move the fork in uh, three different places and the back in two different places. So I have it as slack as it'll go in the high position in the back. So it's kind of like, it's, it's very, very long. It's very long, but so far I haven't minded it on any of the tech. I haven't ridden it all that much, but it's been really fun. And uh, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. It's an, it's an awesome bike. It's got electronic shifting and things like that, which are really nice. So uh, yeah, I, I like the, I like the bike a lot. You had mentioned, um, this is you've actually mentioned it twice, but we should probably explain it. When when you say down country, what is that? It means a bike that has aggressive geometry, but not real aggressive suspension. So they're usually fairly slack and but then they're a little bit underbiked. So the suspension is going to be a little bit less. You know, you have your trail bikes, which are usually around 150, 140, 130. Uh, 140, one, one, so like in the front, 150 or 140, and in the back, yeah. 130, um, maybe 140. If, if uh, a cross country or a race bike is going to be like 120 in the front, 100 in the front, and maybe 100 in the back or 120. And then your Enduros are going to be um, 160, 170 in the front, and maybe 160, 170 in the back. And then downhill, you know, just infinitely larger. So um, many options. So, uh, yeah, they really are. And they're starting to blur the lines between all those categories so that you can get like a really capable cross country bike that can handle a lot of tech and, and the cross country races are getting harder and harder. So uh, yeah. and then you can get a like a or you can get an enduro bike that's kind of like a trail bike. And that's what I got. And they, they you know, specialized with the Evo. They also have a bike called the Enduro, which has a lot more travel. The Evo is is kind of like their mix between um trail bike and enduro bike so it, it it's light enough to pedal around the mountain but it's also aggressive enough to do some um be more comfortable on some some more advanced sort of features and whatnot so yeah it's, it's a really fun bike i'm very i'm very grateful it's uh so far so far i'm really enjoying it so what is your next bike in the garage i mean if we're going by order of importance then it's the road bike but if we're going by yeah. fun it's the single speed <laughs> uh, well i guess you could put the fat bike in the fun category too but yeah i mean yeah. unfortunately or fortunately uh, i don't want to insult any of my road riding friends because you know some people actually really enjoy road riding for me i i have a road bike for one purpose and one purpose only to get stronger for mountain biking and this is a mountain that, bike podcast this is not yeah, a road riding yeah. podcast yes yes we are 
Well, we are pro mountain bike, and I am anti road bike. I'm just going to say it. I'm, I'm anti. No, I, I can't say that. I, all you roadies that are listening, it's cool. It's cool. You can you can come uh, ride with us whenever you want. You know, it's much more fun on the dirt. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm digging a hole here, aren't I? I'm losing. We're losing subs. I can, I can hear them ticking away. <laughs> this guy. I, well, no, I, I understand. I understand your pa- You are probably the, one of the most passionate people I've ever met about mountain biking. And, uh, and uh, I've always appreciated that about you. I, I don't hate road riding <laughs> as much as, as you do, although I find it really dangerous, uh, to, yeah, especially around my area. Yeah. Um, which is around Philadelphia. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners probably have the same experience. It, it gets really dangerous, but it's, it's an unfortunate necessity for me. If I want to get, if I want to keep up with you, I, I got to put the work in. And, uh, that means getting out onto the road bike at least two, sometimes even three times a week, uh, just so they can get my training in. And, uh, so if and that's, a, by that's, order an old, of, that's, that's an old cross bike, isn't it? Yeah, it's a cyclocross bike that I converted into a road bike. Uh, I've had dreams of like converting it back to like a cyclocross slash gravel bike. Um, I don't know that I would actually go that route, but there is something very exciting about getting uh, a bike on the road and then taking it right to a trailhead and then just like hitting the single track with the same bike. Uh, So that that, that, that is something that's exciting, but I, I don't know that I would spend the money to make that happen, especially when I need a a new mountain bike. So yeah, I I don't know. I mean, you have a road bike too. I mean, it doesn't go outside. We are manifesting abundance. There's going to be abundance. We're getting all the bikes. We're getting all the bikes that we need, all the bikes that we want. Honey, we're getting more bikes. Just, just what she wants to hear. Hey, if it comes to the house, I'm in. (laughs) Come to the house. Just just buy a new house, dude. What's the problem? I was always anti gravel even. I you know, I'm just a pure mountain biker and I felt like gravel was was mountain biking for roadies. Uh, but then we were talking the other day, not on the pod, which should be against the rules, should be illegal. We shouldn't be allowed to have any conversations that aren't shared with our listeners. And you made a really good point that, you know, it, it's the ultimate underbike. It you get to it, you yeah. ride your your road bike, this gravel bike, to a trail and then and then you ride now you're riding a, a green or a blue trail. And it's really challenging. You have no suspension. You're on really skinny tires, and, and you got to use all your skill and fitness and, and strength to to get through that. And then you get back on the road and, and ride home. You never you never get in the car. So uh, that sounds that sounds pretty cool. If you have a place to do that, I, I know um, some people ride Valley Forge Park around here. I did that once with Graham, and and it looked it looked pretty fun. So that was kind of cool. I do have a I do have a road bike. It is I'm looking at it right now. It's permanently attached to my trainer. I think if I were to take it off, the uh, the entire trainer and bike would just disintegrate. I just think they would just fall apart. It's, yeah. I have ten, I have over ten thousand miles on that trainer. Uh, I take that that bike has been outside for I think forty four miles, and I have probably like ten thousand five hundred trainer miles on there. So um, it is it is it is completely sweat attached to the house. It comes if, if I ever sell this house the trainer will be attached with the house. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get a mountain bike. You get a rusty old trainer, <laughs> but man, um, you know, I got the, the ERG trainer. I got a Wahoo kicker and I use trainer road and, and it's, it's an awesome workout. It's an awesome workout. I, I mean, so I bought that road bike years and years ago. My business partner convinced me to get one cause he was a roadie. And I did a couple of real short rides. I didn't like it. It went into the shed forever. My wife's like, why don't we sell that thing? And I said, well, you're not going to get anything for it. I may as well hold on to it. And then fast forward a few years later, and someone told me about the trainer. And I had a friend who was getting really, really strong riding a trainer, and I wanted to keep up. And so I bought the trainer, and I just got really into it. I saw I ride the trainer probably at least twice a week, and and they're, they're brutal training rides, but they're they're awesome. So uh, I do really appreciate the road bike that I have. It's just attached permanently to a trainer. I, I would don't think I would ever put a wheel back on it and, and ride it around. And I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like riding on the road. I, I thought it was boring. I mean, just well, haven't tried it in a really long time, but yeah, you have, you have actually two things. One's a bike and one's not a bike, but you actually add two things to your training process. Um, you have a pump track in your backyard, which is amazing for training, but you also have a rip row. 
A rip row, I, I, yes, I do. The rip row is like a pump track simulator, but but this isn't the fitness pod. This isn't the fitness pod. We, if we if we start going down this road, we're not going to finish the bike stable. We got more bikes in the stable. We will get to the fitness pod where so we will talk the about rip row, the rip row is not considered a bike. It's close. No, it's definitely not considered a bike. It has it has bike handlebars. I got a picture of it. I got a picture of it when we do the fitness pod. I'll have a picture of it. Uh, it's got handlebars on it, but no, it's like a, it's a rowing device. It's a rowing machine and it has a seat, but you don't sit on it. So definitely, definitely not a bike. It has no wheels. It has no wheels. Mm. Yes. It's like a sled. <laughs> yes. It's more like a sled. Yeah. All right. So we went road bike. You also, you mentioned fat bike and single speed. So, Pick one. Tell me what you love about it. Tell me what you don't love about it. Let's hear it. There's, there's nothing that I don't love about either of those. I mean, they are, man, well, you and I both spent a lot of time on the single speed and there's a really special place in my heart for that single speed. I'll, I'll probably never sell that thing. Uh, you know what? There is one thing I don't like about it though. It is, it's very old geo. Whenever I get on mm -hmm. it, I'm, I'm just instantly reminded about, you know, how far the industry has come since, you know, we started riding that thing. But you know what? It's also a really good way to get back to basics. You know, you get on that thing and it's I like get on top of my single speed. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, we have the same frame. Yeah. And I get yes. on top of that bike. I'm used to sitting we, we, a, a modern bike. You sit like inside it. You feel like it, it, you're sitting yes. inside of it. And I get on top of that single speed and I, I feel like I'm sitting on top of it. I feel like I'm on stilts, like like I'm 25 feet off the ground. Like the, the Wicked Witch of the West, you know, just like yeah. straight back. Like it does not feel comfortable or safe. Yes. And I'm like, how did we ride these every day? Like every week, this was it. This was yeah. it. And yeah, it just feels like it just wants to pitch you over the handlebars so easily and so quickly. You got to really be on your game for that. Uh, we, yeah. we upgraded these single speeds as much as possible. Tell, tell the listeners what, what you've done to your single speed to try to make it uh, tech worthy. Yo, so I've done a, a couple different really interesting things. One, I'll start out with the one that I, I don't recommend for anyone, but I actually cut the seat tube uh, probably about like two inches to get a longer dropper in there. And this is a titanium frame. So it was like a, a pretty big deal to like, you know, cut this thing down a little bit. But that was... Doing that allowed me to get a longer dropper in there. I was able to get, oh, I think it's about like a 120 now or 140. Still um, not that much. Yeah. What were you, what were you dropping before? What it were you was dropping, like, like 80? 100 or 80? Yeah. It was yeah, basically that's like, like what a, they put on road bike. bikes now. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they put on, on gravel bikes and road bikes <laughs> yes. now. Yeah. That's. Yes. <laughs> so, that, yeah. But, but you know what? That extra little bit made a huge difference. Uh, I, I yeah. love it. Uh, the other upgrade that I put on it was um, I did a headset offset. So it basically added about two degrees to uh, the yeah. angle of the front fork, which again, you know, I'm, I'm you someone really that notices feel that. like you could, I yeah. could really instantly feel that. I actually take that single speed on some of the most crazy tech that we can do at Mount Penn with no issue. Um, and I don't know that I would have done that without that two degree uh, headset um Adjustments. So that was pretty cool. The other secretive thing that I've done that I'm kind of testing out still is I've added handlebar extensions. Uh, I've had these carbon bars on this bike for ages. And, uh, you know, as a YouTuber, I don't make that much money. So, you know, I'm not going to go out and buy another carbon yet. bar. I bought these yet. little, yet, yet, yet. Uh, so I bought these little extenders. They, they add probably about an inch and a half to each side. And I gotta tell you, it's, it's made a world of difference. Cause on a single speed, you know, we're cranking on those bars pretty hard. And so the more narrow it is, the harder it is to get that leverage. And so adding that little inch to inch and a half on the ends of the bars oh, yeah. made a huge difference. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, and, you want a single speed, you're pulling your, your, it, it's almost, it's a rowing motion really. And you yeah. a lot of times you, you have one speed and, and it's hard and you're cranking and you're really using your upper body. You're really pulling with your arms and your chest. And so the wider the handlebar, the more leverage you have. It's a, it's a, it's a really a full body workout. I mean, single speeding is absolutely, if, if you want to go out and get, get trashed in an hour and a half of, of climbing and, and hills and whatnot, like, you know, that it's, it's a great vehicle for that. I, 
I think it's fun. There's yeah. just something so natural about single speeding. Yeah. We'll, we'll do an episode on single speeding because that, that's, our, that's our base and our lineage. And um, we still have a, a, a passion and a real, a real sweet spot for the single speeding. Yeah. We don't ride them that much anymore. The, uh, the full suspension bikes are so capable and you could do so much on them. But single speeding, I think, still has its place. And I don't know how many people have them in the garage. Let us know. Do you have a single speed in your garage? Ride and laugh one at Gmail. Did you used to? Or, uh, or comment in the YouTube. Do you have a single speed? Did you used to have a single speed? Are you interested? You know, it's a, as far as getting another bike, if you want a backup bike, that's, on, that's the cheapest kind you can get. You get like an aluminum frame single speed. There's not all that much going on there. It's, it's a, and you know, you, everyone needs a backup bike. Anyone that mountain bikes knows you need a, you have to have a second bike. Like once you get a first bike, it's very important to get a second bike. So they have a backup and then your backup needs a backup. I mean, you know, just in case I've had two bikes go down. So you, you probably should have, a, I would think three bikes and then yeah. you, you know, maybe, uh, maybe something for, you know, dirt jumping or a pump track. So, you know, maybe four and then obviously some, something to train on. So, so they are looking at five. So, yeah, no, it's not an expensive hobby at all. It's, it's, it's fine, honey. <laughs> There's no reason we can't buy a new house. <laughs> Does it come with five bikes? <laughs> Does it come? <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So the single speed, um, I also have a single speed. If we go back, if we want to go back and forth, I also have a single speed. We both have Carver 420s. They're older frames. They're titanium. Uh, we both did belt drive for a little bit. You stopped belt drive. And I thought belt drive for a different reason because because of my size and my weight and weight to power. And the, I think the fact that it's a titanium frame, I was flexing the frame. We should get that, yeah. into this on the on the single speed um, episode. But I was flexing the frame too much and the belt started to slip. So I think belt drives are made more for commuters than for single speeders. Though if you're yeah. lightweight, I don't know, say you had one, but we can get into that more on the single speed episode. Uh, and then we both ride a geared hardtail, but they're very, very different geared hardtails. What is your geared hardtail? It's another Carver. Uh, I just, I love that brand. They're up in Maine. A really great guy, Forrest. Uh, he, he just... Small company. Very small company. I don't think he actually builds these bikes in-house, but I, I just love their customer service. I love Forrest. I love supporting him. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a fully carbon fat bike. We're talking the frame, the cranks, the the wheels it's it is the, it's the, it is the most pimped it is the most yeah. pimped out fat bike that you will yeah. see it is it is lightweight it is a he has a r- absolute rocket on this thing and so when you say fat bike we're talking four inch tires yeah. 26 four inch, inch tires wheels four inch tires so it feels like a 27.5 so it feels natural um, yes. how aggressive is it and what does a fat bike feel like on the trail because you don't just ride this in snow you ride this on the trail what is, what is all year yeah what is that experience yeah. like it's you know what danny it's now that we have a fork on it because you had a fat bike at 1.2 and and you had a uh, i convinced you to put a fork on that pretty quickly because man those things mm-hmm. are like giant balloons just bouncing on the trail but that fork kind yeah, of nullifies that a little yeah. bit yeah yeah and um I think you said it best, man. It's it's definitely pimped out. I mean, if it, if Exhibit still had his like pimp the ride show, th- this is yes. this is the bike that he would have came up with. It is just completely yes. pimped they're, out. They're, he would have put a TV on it or something like that, right? He always but, put hey. TVs in the trunks and things like that. I never <laughs> understand. It's like who wants a TV in the trunk? But yeah, uh, I, probably no one remembers that show. <laughs> I don't recommend That's going right. back and watching it. It's a lot of TVs no. in trunks. But yes, it is a it's a pimped out ride. Uh, what what is the experience of riding a fat bike on trails? Because I always thought it was super fun, and yeah, um, I always felt like it kind of just smoothed the trail out. You know, like I I got a lot of confidence when I used to ride my fat bike on trails. Yeah, yeah. If you can dial in that that right air pressure, right, and you have a yeah. fork, it does fill in the gaps. And we talked about my twenty seven five, like kind of sinking into like little ruts. The fat bike, it's the tires are so big that you know, you don't fall into those same ruts. And so I don't want to say it smooths it out, but it's definitely a different experience. And, and the traction is, I think that's why I'm so fast on it because it, it mm-hmm. is super light. It's lighter than my full suspension. I think it comes in around like 28 pounds, man, wow. that thing just, it just rockets up, up climbs. Like it, like it's like no one's business. I don't know that it's aggressive enough to be considered an aggressive hardtail because the geo is probably not there. But I certainly yeah. ride it like one. 
But speaking of yeah, aggressive well, hardtails, you got one, right? You got an aggressive hardtail. I do. I do. I do. I do. And I love it. Um, a very, very different bike than than your fat bike. Uh, but the, the I will say that your fat bike, like you, it is does not have aggressive geometry, but n- neither does your full suspension. And you're awesome on that. So mm-hmm. yeah, I just I'm so curious to see what happens when you ride a bike that really does have aggressive geometry. Oh. Uh, yeah, but you're you're awesome on, on that fat bike. And um, so aggressive hardtail. This is something that like I just I feel like I manifested this bike. I feel like I've manifested all my bikes. I just start, I just start dreaming about them, and then, and then, yeah. you know, an opportunity comes, and and the the abundance is there, the and I can afford it, you know, all of a sudden. And my wife's always been awesome and supportive, and um, she she knows I love it. She's like, you're going to use it. If this is this is your passion, you're going to use it. So so get the bike you want. And so my aggressive hardtail is a Banshee Paradox V3, and it is. I watched a lot of hardtail party on YouTube. Yes. And this guy, this guy loves hardtails. Obviously, the name of his channel is Hardtail Party. Uh, you've probably seen it if you're listening. If you haven't, it, it, it's a really good channel. And he's constantly testing hardtails, mostly aggressive hardtails. And he rides in Sedona, and he rides all sorts of ha- trails and, and, um, and, and technical stuff. And this was a few years ago. And he, he settled on the Banshee Paradox v3 and he was like i'm bought this is going to be my this is going to be my personal bike and, and that so he kept testing bikes but that was his main bike and so i was like well that's the bike i want to get to and i and i also knew a guy around here who who got one right around the same time just a, a guy on strava and who i we had ridden with before ryan stanky he he got one and he yes. loved it and he's a fast dude and and he was so you know he was like yeah dude i give it a big thumbs up so i went ahead and and built one up and it's uh it's super super slack and it's got a big travel fork on the front uh i don't i don't remember exactly i think it's a 160 on the front 170 on the front something like that yeah probably like a 64 degree head angle but it's a hardtail so it's kind of like that down country we were talking about um the the shape of it when you ride it and you're going downhill it feels like it, it just wants to go fast and it can, yeah. it can get away from you because the front is party and the back is business. Uh, maybe that's backwards. I don't know. But I mean, it's very easy to just start getting too fast. And then there's a hard tail on the back and you're, you know, you're starting to catch rocks and, and get caught up or um, or you might just be going like light speed. And then all of a sudden you hit something hard. And it feels yeah. like it should be a full suspension bike. And I've broken wheels on it several times because I'm hucking on this thing because it's just it's so cool. It's so fun. It's so comfortable. And it's a hardtail. So I finally put a tire insert into the back. So hopefully that fixes that problem. But yep. I used to ride uh, one of in Philadelphia. The, the big city park here is West of Hicken. And on my way to work, I used to stop there and ride there almost once a week. And I would single speed there. I'd ride my geared bike. And I really and and getting something like an aggressive hardtail which is really fun and you still have hardtail so it doesn't climb as well as a as like maybe an xc hardtail but it's still fairly light and it still has that like that when you put the power down the power you go because it's a hardtail so yeah. it's a really really good way these are i think bikes like this are really good ways to mix up your local trails that you're riding so you can single speed on the trail or you can take your aggressive hardtail or your fat bike and, and, and get excited about the same trails that you're riding. You know, the first thing I would say is ride the, ride your regular loop the other direction and it's a whole new trail. Okay. You know, and then you do that a few times then, and then, yeah, if you're, if you're passionate and, and have the means and you love mountain biking, like Sage and I do, you, you start collecting different bikes and and it's really fun. I mean, I, I love I love what we have in our stable. We do turn to the full suspensions the most, but we have some really fun bikes in there. And I think they've added to our progression. I think they've added to our skill. It takes a lot more a, a different type of skill to ride a hardtail, right? When you when you say that that there's a um, um, a step up in in effort. We, we, well, I don't want to put words in in your mouth. I mean, what what would you say are the benefits of riding a hardtail? Yeah, there's no doubt because that's another that's another standalone episode. I was just about to say that's a standalone episode. I mean, there's just so many advantages to learning on a hardtail. And I I think the biggest I think a good conversation for us to have you and I is is probably a a conversation on which is better for your first bike, you know, a hardtail or full suspension, Uh, because there are really good points on either side of that, you know. Uh, But yeah, we should leave that. We should leave that for a different episode. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that would be a really good good one. All right. Um, so it, 
one more bike. If you if you would add another bike to the stable, any dream bike, not not necessarily dream bike, but just like you know, random bike that you know, n- no budget. What what would you add? What kind of bike? I I would probably. St- you and I had gone back and forth about this a lot, but I, I still really want an aggressive hardtail. Like, I, I, mm. I don't know. It almost seems wasteful because I have the two hardtails, but I don't know. I just think I'd really have fun on, a, on a, an aggressive hardtail. I mean, I know I need a full suspension, but if I had a throwaway bike, money was not a thing. I probably would lean toward an aggressive hardtail, maybe like a Ragley. Oh, that's very interesting. The, the Umbop yeah. or something like that. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to know if, if you know, from our, our listeners, you know, what kind of bikes they would recommend for me, you know, for, for yeah. either the, the replacement for a full suspension or, you know, do they have, uh, you know, what are their bikes that they have on their wish list? You know, I'd love to know, you mm-hmm. know, what is it? Ride and laugh, G- ride and laugh one at Gmail, right? Yes. Let's, let's, yes. let's get them coming. I, I'd love to hear the suggestions. Yeah, 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 definitely. Suggestions for Sage 27.5 full suspension bike or 29er full suspension bike. You know he loves a DW Link. So what, you know, what should he be looking to demo? And what kind of bikes do you guys have? What kind of bikes do you have in your, in your bike stable? What's your favorite bike? And what are you looking to add? What would be a dream ad? No budget dream ad bike you know, that, that you got your eye on and let's manifest this stuff, you know, Hey, let's write it down in that journal. I've said, you write it down, you write down the bike you want and you visualize it. And then you, and then you bring in the emotion of riding it and the emotion of seeing your garage. Cause for me, that's a big yes. part of it. It's just pulling into yes. the garage and, and seeing my bikes there. Like, just like, yeah, there they are. I want I can't wait to ride, you know, just, just awesome. You know, you, you put it on the rack in the morning, in the morning or the night before and just, yeah, I'm ready to ride. I'm ready to go. If I were going to pick a dream bike that with no budget, you know, it would be irresponsible. I think I would try a full downhill bike, like a full downhill. Yes. And because I'm so I'm I've been riding bigger travel bikes lately and I'm so blown away with how much fun they are. Uh, you know, I, I feel like we've been underbiked. It, it's another it's, it's another episode underbike versus overbiked and you know, the differences and, and, and the benefits. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I'd be very curious to take a full downhill bike to a bike park and see yeah. what that felt like. I'd be very, dual very crown. Curious, so. Yeah. 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 That'd be a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah. The whole thing, you know, like you just, it doesn't need to pedal at all. Just, just like totally slacked out. Just tremendous amount of travel. Just, you know, heavy, stable. Who, who's got a downhill bike? Let us know. What is that? What does that feel like? What is, what kind of confidence does that give you at the bike park? Where else do you ride it? And are you happy that you got one or is an enduro bike enough? You know, isn't it? Is, so what do you think? Ride and laugh one at Gmail. Let us know about these bikes and YouTube comment, you know, let us know just, just a quick note. Yeah, man, I got a downhill bike and it's awesome. Or no, it's a waste, it's a waste of money. I, I could do everything on my enduro bike and or my trail bike. I don't need an enduro bike. I got my trail bike. I mean, you can go any, any different direction here. Uh, let's see. Mountain bike gratitude of the week. What are you thinking about this week, Sagey? Man, I am just to go back to what we started the show with, uh, which is just I am so grateful uh, for all our supporters. Um, I know I had um, before we launched this to the public, I had actually launched it to my Patreon tribe. And man, those guys and gals came through and just really gave us some really good feedback. And uh, I, I'm just so grateful for all of them. They they keep this engine running. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all my Patreon uh, subscribers and, and members. They're just awesome. My gratitude of the week is going to be very similar. I, I, re- I really appreciate everybody listening and the feedback that we've gotten. And I have to throw out a special thank you to Johnny Yu at, at Mountain Bike Q&A. That was just so cool of him to listen to a few podcasts and say, like, yeah, you know, these guys, these guys got something. And yeah. he had already interviewed Sage, so so I was up and I had a great conversation with him, and the chat was really funny, and uh, I, I encourage everyone to go check that out. But it was it was really really nice of Johnny to see something in us, and he kept saying it. He was very very flattering. He said, you know, this is you guys got something here. This is a really fun listen, and there's not anything else like this right now. It's unique and keep going and you know we're, we're really new at this and so that that means a lot to someone that's been doing this for a while and and he's successful he has, he has a nice following so so thank you a yeah. lot johnny i really appreciate the the time you took to interview me and uh, and all the kind words that you had to say and and everyone that responded to that 
to that webcast uh, really kindly. Uh, it's nice. It's nice to hear. So we have so much gratitude to all of our listeners. If you're still listening, we appreciate it. You are definitely one of us. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you ranking, uh, liking and subscribing. We appreciate you um, turning on all your notifications, anything that helps the algorithm and certainly on your podcast player, giving us a five star review and listening. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. So much gratitude. Uh, we're having so much fun. We got a lot more fun stuff planned. We're looking forward to it. You're a mountain biker. We're a mountain biker. You love riding. We love riding. Thank you again. Go ride your bikes. Ride and laugh. See you, everybody.